Um, this uh, this uh, is a special meeting that we're not using meeting in our usual uh, noon hour, uh, but we wanted to uh, 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 host uh, Dexter Filkins to talk about his just marvelous you know new book, The Forever War, uh, which is available for purchase outside the door. Um, the purpose of this series is to uh, look at the full range of issues in the ter under the, the terrorism and homeland security rubric. Uh, today's uh, uh, session judging from the, from the book will be different in tone in that usually we have sort of straight policy analysis and, and what this book presents is sort of a powerful and uh, in powerful and compelling language is sort of a very much of a first person account of, of uh, uh, the events that unfolded in Iraq during the period that uh, Dexter Filkins was, was in country. Um, most of you have consumed his uh, writings in the New York Times where he's a foreign correspondent He's covered wars in Afghanistan and Iraq since 2001. Before that, he worked for the Los Angeles Times, where he was chief of the paper's New Delhi Bureau and for the Miami Herald. He's been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and a winner of the P George Polk Award and two overseas press club awards. Uh, most recently, he was a fellow at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at Harvard University. Uh, the reviews for this book have been glowing. Uh, he's been called the preeminent war correspondent of his generation. Uh, Bruce Hoffman by uh, um, uh, Blackberry emailed me to say Dexter Filkins is the type of reporter whose entire work is filled is filed from the field, always in the thick of things, whether in Fallujah with the Marines or on the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan with the tribes. Uh, uh, Lee Hamilton, the president of this institution, reviewed this book for the New York Times recently uh, and wrote that the book was gut-wrenching and touching. Mr. Phil Filkin's stories are those of a writer willing to endure hardship, danger, and anguish to paint an accurate picture of war for the American public. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome Dexter Filkins to the Woodrow Wilson Center. He will speak for roughly half an hour. That'll, then we'll open it up for comments and questions from the floor, and then adjourn uh, a little after five for uh, the reception and book signing. So with that, Dexter Filkins, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks very much. You know what? I'm going to just... Uh, Let's see if this works. I just actually feel better standing, uh, maybe because I just had lunch. Um, so. <laughs> we, are, we are being webcast, so um, just to make sure if there's a problem with the audio, the, the technician will let us know that he's, if he's getting a strong enough uh, signal. Okay. Um, but it should work. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you very much. And uh, let me try to speak into this. You know, um, uh, I think this will, my presentation, or, or whatever we want to call it, might be a little bit different from probably the ones that you get here. I, I imagine that the, the ones you usually get are kind of, you know, you, have, you talk about ideas and about, about policy and about solutions. Um, my book's not really about those things. I, I actually tried uh, very consciously not to make any sort of argument whatsoever. Um, I, I found that actually wasn't very hard for me. I, I found that I often found uh, when I was in, whether it was Iraq or Afghanistan, um, and I came out, uh, and I'd you know turn on the TV, and I'd see some retired colonel making some argument about. We're gonna switch you over to the mobile. About uh, it's on. It should, it's on. on. Okay. Um, really, there was nothing so shocking as to kind of turn on CNN or Fox and uh, listen to some guy from a TV studio tell me what I needed to think about Iraq. Um, and I, I think, frankly, uh, in 2008, we're all kind of exhausted by the arguments, and we all know them very well. Um, what, what I thought I could do and what I wanted to do was kind of, in my book, was give people or give you uh, a, a visceral kind of sense of what it's like to be there, uh, a kind of uh, an emotional book ra rather than an intellectual one. Um, I've, I've been, uh, you know, my book's called The Forever War, and it already feels like forever uh, to me. Um, I, um, you know, it was, it was almost ten years ago that I... I um, I was at the Kabul Sports Stadium on a Friday afternoon, uh, sitting at midfield watching these very strange men uh, read Quranic verses and amputate a man's hand and put another man to death. Um, and I look back, um, and I'm going to show you some pictures from that time in just a second. Um, I look back in the time, and it's, it was, it's, such, it's so strange in retrospect, because of course, in 1998, um, you know, very few people even knew who the Taliban were. Um, and they certainly didn't matter to anyone. Uh, and Afghanistan certainly didn't matter to anyone. Uh, it was kind of a freak show, uh, frankly. And, um, 
that kind of changed. Of course, it changed dramatically in 2001, but um, it's very strange in retrospect. So I want to kind of, what I've done here is, um, and I hope it's kind of interesting and entertaining for you, I've, I always, or almost always, traveled with a photographer. So uh, I have some very nice photos from that time, which I thought I would show you. Um, and kind of walk you through it, uh, rather than, I, I might read a couple of little places from the book, but um, it's kind of funny, I have a, like, as if none of you know uh, where Afghanistan is, <laughs> country in Central Asia. Um, you know, to be in Afghanistan uh, is just extraordinary. I don't know how well you can all see it. Maybe we could cut these lights here or something um, to kind of darken it. Um, it's just an amazing place um, when you kind of, you know, uh, you've all seen it and heard about it on television. Um, when you kind of step off the helicopter, um, it's as if you've kind of walked into the fourth century. And um, you go into these villages. I think I'm losing some people back there. Um, <laughs> um, you go into these villages, and it's kind of uh, uh, that haven't even seen the wheel yet. I mean, they're so, I mean, it's like the fourth century. Um, and uh, as I said, let me just, uh, I'll take you through. It's just an extraordinary place. Um, Th these are all from the late 1990s uh, in Afghanistan. I was, part of the time I was in the Taliban country and then other parts of the time I was in the north uh, where Ahmed Shah Massoud, you remember the rebel commander uh, who, who was so famous for fighting the Soviet Union, was kind of holding out against the Taliban. Um, this is actually a donkey parking lot. I don't know if you can see that. Um, and that's sort of father time uh, tending the flock there. Um, these are, this is just a village. I'm going to take you through here. Um, you know, uh, this is actually, this is amazing. This is a, uh, uh, you know, Afghanistan is subject to, uh, you know, any number of things, famines, uh, you know, wars, pestilence, and also earthquakes. And this is a ravine from an earthquake that kind of opened up in, in, in the country there. Um, I'm going to walk you through a couple of these. You know, for me, um, I was... Um, when I think back on nine, when I think back to 9/11, and I, I kind of search for a, a one-sentence explanation for it, um, it's it's not uh, you know uh, we've we, you've all here have debated all these things you know ad nauseum. Um, for me, it's much more it's it's a much more gut thing. Um, actually, this is a nice photo. This is a uh, this is a, a man who's a photographer, and that's his little camera there, uh, and that's him in the camera when he was a younger man. And of course, whenever you Whenever, you, if you look like me, uh, and you get off a helicopter or you step into a, and you pull a camera out, you always get a large crowd of people around you. But I want to, um, I want to take you to one photo in particular. For me, uh, when I look back to Afghanistan in 1998, when I landed there, um, the it was it was a completely destroyed civilization. I mean, already, um, you know, at that point, the country had been at war for 20 years. Um, it was it was completely destroyed. I remember the packs of of orphans that used to run through the city, there'd be in, in you know fifty and a hundred at a time, they kind of descend on you, and the city was the city was completely ruined. This actually is Jaidi Maiwand. It's the main shopping street in downtown Kabul, um, in, in September 1998. Um, you know what better explanation for the Taliban than that? Um, there isn't a better one, really. Um, that's basically what Afghanistan had become then, and I remember people telling me. Um, people in people in Kabul at the time, you know, nobody was crazy about the Taliban, but it was, you know, the the city and the country had fallen into this terrible, terrible anarchy uh, that you know came out of the civil war that followed the re the retreat of the Soviet Union, and people would say to me, I remember there were people living in the rubble here. Um, I mean, I remember them kind of coming out to greet me as I as I walked up um, to drive across Kabul um, in nineteen in, in 1992. Uh, this is this is you know before the Taliban. Um, there were 41. At one point, there were 41 different militias and militia checkpoints that kind of crisscrossed the city. And so you could talk to people, and they'd say, "My God, you know, I couldn't go out with my daughter or my wife or my son. You'd have to pay bribes. People would be raped." <clears throat> then came the Taliban, and that and that that you know it was an easy thing to see when you were on the ground. These these were whatever else they were. You know, they were the law and order boys. You know, and they brought. They, they kind of grabbed hold of this anarchy and, like, wrestled it to the earth, you know. Um, and they were the toughest, meanest guys in town. And, and so that day in the, in, the Kabul, in the Kabul sports stadium, 
Um, these are just some nice shots from northern Afghanistan. That day in the Kabul Sports Stadium when I saw the execution and the amputation, it was completely intelligible. Um, you know, they were, I remember they were reading this verse from the Quran. They were saying, in revenge there is life. You know, in revenge there is life. As they kind of brought the guy out uh, to be executed. And, and then they said at one point, you know, the crowd was very sort of numb. You know, I, I always remember that. It wasn't, people weren't cheering. It wasn't like the sort of Roman Coliseum. Um, and, um, and the man was sort of riffing on, on, on that he would kind of depart from his Quranic verse, and he would say, we have to do this, you know, we have to do this, you know, or the anarchy will return, you know. And, um, and there you had it. I mean, that was the Taliban. And, and I think, um, I want to just go through a few things here. Um, I, I was, um, and, and all this is in the book, um, I, um, I, the Taliban changed over, over the course of the time that I was there. Um, I, I, I was arrested by the Taliban in 2000 uh, and expelled. I was kind of held under house arrest for a while. And, but basically, and I, and I think, you know, this is true of so many movements throughout history. They kind of started in a you know, very righteous, um, you know, noble bunch of guys, or at least they had noble intentions. They were very fierce and very hard. But they kind of got corrupted over time. And um, you could hear that. I remember when I came back, when I came back over the years into the country, 1999 and then 2000, when I finally got expelled, you know, uh, the Afghans would say things like, you know, the Arabs are here. Um, you know, uh, they've got a lot of money. They're taking over the movement. It's becoming very radical. They're training camps outside of town. Um, I remember there was even a volleyball game that used to, the Arabs used to gather for volleyball uh, on Friday afternoons uh, after the executions uh, at a kind of volleyball court outside of town. And those are the kinds of things that, you know, that, that we were all hearing at the time. And I, I remember... There wasn't anything you could you could do about it. Um, I remember I called uh, my one of my editors back in back in the United States, and you know whenever you call your editor, they don't have any time for you, and they just want to know what you're going to write for the next day. And uh, and I said to them, look, this isn't a story, uh, but God, it feels bad here. You know, something really bad is going to happen because it was sort of, you know, it was it was this. Uh, this is actually a nice show. This is sort of father and son glass blowing company. Um, uh, it was kind of, uh, it was getting bad, and then in Pakistan, where I spent a lot of time as well, um, you know, you could see these things. You could walk into a madrasa, and there would be, you know, 500 young kids, you know, talking about jihad, you know, and half of them would be from outside the country. Um, and it was so clear then that kind of this was all going to some terrible end. Um, nobody knew what the end was, um, of course. Um, there's actually four sisters in Kabul. Um, so I'm just going to walk you through a couple of more. I might just read a couple of graphs from my book. Um, this is kind of the Afghan, Afghan version of American Gothic. Um, <laughs> father, son, and premium. This is, I don't know if you can see this, but um, you know, this is Talakan, which is in northern Afghanistan. And I was there. This, is, this, this photo was taken in 1999. And the Taliban were kind of just outside of town. They hadn't come into town yet. And, and sort of the northern alliance then was kind of holding out against them. And I, after I left in 1999, the Taliban came in about a month later, and they held the place for about two years. And, and I, I got to go back uh, with the Northern Alliance in November of 2001 on this same street. And, you know, it doesn't look like Times Square, but um, it was this extraordinary scene. I mean, I, you know, we're in year seven in Afghanistan now, and it's kind of a very different war. But in November of 2001, uh, it was, you know, it was like a party. I mean, you know women were tearing their burqas off and, you know, they, men were digging up these TV sets that they buried in the ground, you know, in plastic bags and they were cutting their beards off and, and all the shots that you probably saw on television. But it was just an extraordinary time. Very different time, of course. Um, this is actually, this is Masood. Um, I met him in 1999. If you remember, he was, uh, he looks like sort of a, an Italian painter here, you can see. Um, uh, he was a really extraordinary guy. I mean, he was, you know, he was fluent in French and he kind of had this he kind of had this sense of the world outside of, you know, he was a warlord, and some of these warlords in Afghanistan, you know, they can sort of, you know, pull the limbs off of babies. I mean, and he, he was actually a kind of, uh, he was somebody you could talk to, you know. Um, and if you remember, he was killed uh, two days before 9-11. Um, I think, you know, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban knew full well that the Americans were going to come looking for him uh, after 9-11. They were right. Um, and so they did. But... Um, let me, uh, of course, at the time he had a very modern army. 
Um, this is just his mountain hideaway. I'm just going to go through a few of these. Um, a couple of these here. This is just, uh, again, the Taliban were just kind of right over the hill here. I'm going to take you up with these photos right up to, basically right up to the 2001 war. Um, this is kind of a nice picture. I don't know, the, the, you can see it's in English there. You know, these kids couldn't read anything. I mean, they couldn't read Persian, much, le much less English. Um, and here they were, uh, very happily. And, you know, the whole, econ the whole local economy was sort of, you know, subsisting on opium smuggling. So it was a nice photo. Um, let me give you a couple of more here. Um, these are the same young guys. Now, we're kind of getting into 2001 here, and I want to kind of walk you through a couple of these before I get to the, the more cheery subject of Iraq. Um, this is actually, yeah, this is 2001 in northern Afghanistan. This was taken from a girls' school um, in the far north of Afghanistan in, in November, in, excuse me, October of 2001. I want to, um, uh, let me just, uh, let me take you. This is, a, this is an old cemetery. I want to tell you what it was like then. This is kind of a nice shot. These were the, some Northern Alliance soldiers. And you can see they actually have uniforms on, which was kind of remarkable. Uh, these uniforms kind of dropped out of the sky, you know, from the Americans in October of 2001. Um, you know, I went back after 9-11. Uh, I flew to Tajikistan uh, and kind of made my way to the Afghan border to that that very small pocket that was still controlled by the anti-Taliban rebels, and that's where kind of, you know, the, all the American Special Forces guys were going. And it was just an amazing, uh, if I could just paint the picture for you, um, I, I remember standing on the, on the banks of the Amu Darya River, and just a few hundred yards across w w was Afghanistan. And, and their sort of supply line had, had shrunk so to, to this tiny, it was about a 200-yard stretch of river, and there was one tiny barge that used to go back and forth across. And it was in mortar range of the Taliban. So as we kind of crossed the river, you know, we crossed the Amu Darya River on this, on this crummy little, you know, uh, plywood barge. We were getting mortared the whole time. And that's how close it was. I mean, they, they, I remember talking to the Northern Alliance people afterwards, and they said, you know, maybe one more year we could have held out, you know, maybe one more summer. Uh, and after that, we were finished. Uh, and of course, everything everything changed for them. But they were kind of given up by the by the time by the time 9/11 happened. Um, so let me uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. If you can bear it, uh, I'm going to take you up to a photo here. I'm going to read you a couple of graphs in the book. Um, this is basically the first day of the American bombing. Uh, in I think it was October 12, 2001. Um, I don't know how many of you have been in the presence of a two, of a 2,000 pound bomb going off, but it's not. You know, it's not like the movies. It's, um, you know, the ground shakes, you know, for, you know, for seconds on end. And um, One of and our current fellows is an Air Force colonel who flew a B-2 that night, I guess. Uh, well, we probably know. have a lot to talk about. Those are my bombs. I have to say, well, I'll tell you what. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read just a couple paragraphs from that time. Here, let me show you. Uh, there's another nice photo here. Um, This is basically, uh, okay, so from there, if you just bear with me, it's just a couple of graphs from, the, from that day, basically. Um, maybe I'll sit down for that. Let's see. Here we go. Okay. Let's see. Extra, this was the day right after 9-11? No, this October was 12. October 12th. If you remember, 9-11 happened. My, yeah, it's about a month later. I mean, if you remember, it kind of took it took it took everybody a little while. To, it took the Americans a while to kind of gear up. And I remember we were kind of waiting. Um, I was with a photographer, the guy who took these photos, named James Hill. You know, we were in this tiny little town called Hoja Baudin, and we had rented this mud hut. You know, and you know, spent most of our time looking for gasoline and kind of generators and stuff, and throwing money around to anybody who had anything to buy. Um, kind of waiting for the war to start. Uh, it was a very strange time. You didn't see much of the Americans. Um, so with that, let me just read you. I'll just read you a couple of graphs. On a clear day, you could see the B-52s overhead, their contrails marking the, the sky in long white streaks. 
They seemed to float up there, so high above. Sometimes, given their altitude, they took half an hour to traverse the whole horizon. The exhaust plumes hung in the air after the planes had moved on, so on some afternoons the whole sky would be looped and crisscrossed, white against the blue, like a work of abstract art. It wasn't just the bombs they dropped that were so unnerving. It was the lumbering, disassociative way they let them go. One of the bombers would make an appearance, usually at 30,000 feet, a tiny gray V in the sky, all the way from Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean, 3,000 miles away, gliding like a crane. Then, without warning, the sharp, titanic bursts, the clouds tumbling upward, the ground moaning as if something crucial in the world had broken off and fallen away. And then you'd look up, and there the plane would be, arcing, plodding, moving against the great blue sky. Sometimes at night, working late in the mud brick hut, I'd hear the faint whoop, 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 and I'd rush out outside, and if I was lucky, I'd see a blackened silhouette against the star-flecked night. A helicopter without lights, here then gone. The Americans were here, the Afghan said, but I didn't see any of them until much later. On the morning the bombing started, the windows in my house clinked and rattled for minutes on end, like a tea service in an earthquake. I drove as fast as I could, as far as I could, forded the Kokcha River on a horse, ran crouching through the muddy Northern Alliance trenches, reached the most forward post, and peeked my head over the top. The Taliban positions were just in view, only 300 yards away. A rolling green field lay between. Up and down the Taliban trench line, the blast from the bombs had left gigantic circles of blackened grass, like the footprints of some huge beast, 50 feet wide, blackened hoof after blackened hoof, concentric and overlapping. The bombs had hit the trenches precisely, gone directly inside. And there, across the field, rose the turban head of a Taliban soldier, looking to his right, then to his left, amazed, perhaps, that he was alive. I felt sorry for those Taliban fighters. I really did. Just sitting in their trenches, trapped, uncomprehending, waiting to be bombed. I was right about that, right about what they'd felt. I saw the Taliban prisoners afterwards, dirty and frightened, and all they talked about were the bombs. For the Taliban, the waiting was the worst. A B-52 would appear in the sky, drop a bomb or two, and then begin its great U-turn toward its home on Diego Garcia. The B-52s took forever to make that turn, arcing slowly and grandly, turning like an aircraft carrier. And just when I thought the B-52 was finally headed south, headed home, it would keep turning, keep circling back, and then I knew it was coming back for another run. Some, sometimes it would take a half an hour. And then I'd imagine the Taliban guys in their trenches, fiddling with their prayer beads, looking up, waiting. Um, okay, so let me, just, let me just roll through a few more of these. You know, I could sit here and talk about these photos, each one of these, for about a half an hour. Um, this is actually outside of Kunduz. I don't know if you all remember, in November of 2001, there were several thousand Taliban and Al-Qaeda fighters were trapped inside this city. This is actually the Northern Alliance kind of marching in. They thought they had a deal, uh, and they thought that the Taliban had surrendered. Everybody was kind of marching in very confidently. And it turned out it was a double cross, uh, and everything, the Taliban attacked, and everything kind of disintegrated. This is that same army kind of going to pieces. Um, but I want to just, uh, let me just roll through a couple of more of these. Um, I, don't know if, I, I don't know how many of you have been to northern Afghanistan, but it's the, it's the steppe, you know, and it's, you can't see it here because it kind of sweeps in the other direction, but it's, you know, it's, you, you can stand on the steppe in Afghanistan, you can look for 150 miles and not even see a tree, you know, it's just completely, it's flat as a tabletop and it just kind of goes on forever. And uh, James Hill and I were kind of driving across the steppe towards Mazari Sharif where the big prison riot was happening, if you remember that too, that's where John Walker was captured. When we came across this, uh, ten trucks full of prisoners, uh, Taliban prisoners, uh, taken by the Northern Alliance. Um, and of course, you know, um, the Afghans weren't really used to taking prisoners. Um, and so they kind of jammed them in the trucks here, and it was just an extraordinary scene. Um, we kind of walked up, and what I remember about this is we walked up to the trucks, and, and, 
uh, they were kind of, you know, they didn't have any water, and so they were sort of shouting for water in about six different languages. You know, it was kind of Arabic and Pashto and, and Urdu and Chechen and kind of, it was just amazing. Um, the amazing thing about these photos is if you look at these prisoners, um, most of these guys, I think almost all of them, were killed shortly after this and just buried in the desert, um, kind of the Afghan way, really. Um, here, let me just... Uh, This is actually a scene from the prison that day, from the, the, the next day, Mizari Sharif. Um, boy, again, I could talk for a long time. Um, this is a, a Saudi Arabian kid, uh, 19 years old, named uh, Fahad Nasir. And he had made his way, uh, you know, to fight the jihad in Afghanistan. And all you have to do is kind of look at him, you know. Um, he's... Um, He's not some big, drooling, you know, knuckle-dragging zealot. Uh, he just was a middle-class kid that used to, like, eat in the IHOP in Riyadh. And he knew a bunch of Americans and kind of, it, he kind of, it was a fool's journey, you know, like it is for a lot of them. Um, he had been shot. I don't know if you can see that. I don't think he made it. I don't think he survived much longer either. Uh, it was a pretty rough time back then. Actually, that's sort of yours truly, on the road to Kandahar. Um, this is Kabul. Um, Okay, now very quickly, how can I race through a couple very quickly? I still have six minutes to race through Iraq. Um, I'm going to ask you to mentally change gears very hard. Okay, clank, clank. Bam. Okay, there's Iraq. Um, I'm going to go through these photos really quick, and I'll just stop in a couple of places. Um, this is a nice photo. This is the sandstorm going up. And the best part of this photo, of course, is the little Skittles packet. You can see it there. Um, this was an ambush on the way up. I just, I'm going to stop in a couple of places here and just talk about a couple of the things in the photos. Um, this is the desert going up. Um, this is an amazing shot. This was, um, I just want to talk about this for a second. You know, this is April 9th, 2003, the day the regime came down. Um, and it was, it was such an extraordinary day. Um, you know, I, I was in this kind of, I rented a car in Kuwait City the day the invasion started, and I just drove in. You know, it was like the dumbest thing I ever did, but I drove 300 miles, whatever it is, north to Baghdad. And on April 8th, the night before, um, James Hill and I, same guy, we, uh, we camped out in a palm grove. Um, and we were shadowing some Marines, and we kind of talked to them, and, and they said, well, you know, maybe there's going to be a fight. Maybe there isn't. Um, and so... We drove in at 7 o'clock in the morning, and let me show you a couple more of these. Well, this is sort of a happier time. This is Saddam's palace. Um, this is actually the central bank building. By 7 a.m., the, the looting had started in Baghdad. You know, uh, by 8 a.m., uh, the ministries were on fire. You know, by noon, it was clear that uh, the whole city was kind of out of control. And I, I know, you know, you all remember that time. I just... Um, it was such an extraordinary moment because you could... You know, here was this kind of conquering army... Uh, it had come 300 miles in 19 days. Um, you know, you, I remember driving up, you could just see the Iraqi uniforms on the side of the road. Guys were just peeling their uniforms off and throwing them. Um, and, the, and the conquering army marches into Baghdad, and then everything goes to hell uh, in, in a space of about six hours. Uh, and you could just kind of feel the wind go out of it that day. You really could. Um, I mean, I felt like... I felt like I was on my high school football team, and we were ahead by 40 to nothing in the fourth quarter, and we were going to lose the game, you know? Um, let me, uh, well, this is a nice photo. It doesn't need, need much explanation, does it? Um, uh, you know, I, I, should, I should stop here and just tell you just a little bit, and maybe we could talk about this since I only have a, few, a couple of minutes left. Um, you know, I just, I just come from Iraq. Um, uh, just, just like 10 days ago, I just got back. It's very different now. It's much better. Um, in the old days, in the, begin in the early days, in 03 and 04, when we could sort of drive around anywhere, you could go to the Sunni Triangle and you could, you could uh, here, let me show you. You could, you could go to the Sunni Triangle into these villages, and you could see that it was so clear that the Americans weren't ready for the insurgency. They just hadn't really thought through it. Um, and they would kind of go in and they would basically just grab everybody, you know, just grab, grab the males, you know, anybody from 19 to 35 that kind of doesn't have a smile on his face, just take them away. And you could see what was happening. I mean, in their kind of, you know, in their, 
desire to kill and capture <laughs> bad guys. Uh, they were basically growing the insurgency, and it was just you know if you were there that if you were there then it was easy to see, and it was kind of you know it was kind of like watching a car wreck in slow motion. Um, it's very very different now, of course. I mean, they, you know, the, the whole sort of objective of the war now is not to kill people uh, or kill bad guys. It's basically to kind of embrace the civilian population and thereby separate them from the bad guys. And it's, it's um, you know, we can talk about the current situation there. I think it's very fragile, but it's, it's also very calm. Um, and it's, it's a nice thing to see. Let me, let me just, I'm going to walk through a couple more photos and I'm going to shut up. And maybe we can just take a couple of questions. Um, you know, it's, it's a frustrating thing to be a reporter uh, from Iraq in, in one sense. When you, when you come back here and you, you know, uh, the, new, the news, particularly on television, uh, they'll say, well, 50 people were killed today in a car bombing, you know, and you just kind of switch off. It doesn't really mean anything. Well, if you've ever been in a car bombing, and here's a couple of photos from a car bombing, um, it's basically the end of the world, you know. Um, and if you can imagine, this was the suicide bombing that struck the International Committee for the Red Cross in October of 2003. It came right after the bombing of the UN building. You know, within a couple of weeks of this attack, every aid organization and NGO had left the country. Um, and uh, it, this is one car bombing, you know, one. And um, since 2003, there have been about a thousand suicide bombings in Iraq. Uh, there's been about 3,000 car bombs. There's been about, you know, 20,000 IEDs. Um, if you can just sort of imagine what that would do to a city the size of Washington, say, the metropolitan area. Um, you know, what it would do to it physically, what it would do, what it would do to people's brains, you know. Um, if you can sort of imagine the trauma. I have, I remember this bombing very well because it was so close to the New York Times house. I remember it was about 8.30 in the morning and our whole house shook. And we got there before the police and the soldiers. And um, it's just some 19-year-old kid from, from Maine. But I remember as I was running in, there's a girls' school kind of right next to the ICRC. You can't really see it. And I just remember the Iraqi schoolgirls coming out with their, you know, little white shirts and their blue uniforms on, kind of, you know, eyes wide, mouths open, kind of running away, you know. That's a car bombing. Um, okay, I'm just going to have to go through. The, this is actually, again, I could talk for a half an hour about every one of these. This is the Moksin Mosque in, in Sadr City. And, you know, at the New York Times, for reasons I've never understood, we always refer to Sadr City as a neighborhood. It's like three million people. You know, it's about half of Baghdad. Um, if you go to the Moksin Mosque on a Friday afternoon, um, you'll get basically a crowd of 25,000 people praying in the street. And it's an extraordinary thing. I don't know if you can see the poster of Muqtad al-Sadr kind of just over on the left up against the wall. It's kind of his place. And you can actually stand, you know, you can sort of stand like right here. And as they start to shout Muqtada, 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 you can actually feel, you can sort of feel it coming off the crowd. It's extraordinary. It really is. Um, this is just a scene from Fallujah. I'm going to have to go through these very quickly. This is me actually trying to write a story from a latrine. Um, you know, these are, I'm, I'm just going to, uh, I'll sort of wrap this up here. I, I went into Fallujah uh, in, with, with uh, a company of Marines in November of 2004 for the big battle there. It was, you know, it's the biggest battle of the war. Uh, 100 Americans were killed, about 600 were wounded. Uh, I was with a company of guys, uh, Bravo Company, the 1-8 Marines. You know, in eight days, 25% uh, of the unit I was with was killed or wounded. I mean, it was very, very intense. And, uh, and you know, most of these guys are just 19-year-olds, and they're not, you know, they're not, from, they're not from northwest Washington, you know, and they're not from Cambridge, Massachusetts, or Manhattan, or Santa Monica, you know. They're from Starkville, Mississippi, and Oswatomi, Kansas. This is DeMarcus Ware. Uh, 22 from Martinsville, Virginia. He was killed a couple of days after the, after this photo was taken. Um, we were just in a break in Fallujah, and the photographer I was with, Ashley Gilbertson, snapped some of these shots. Um, I'll just go through a couple of more. Everybody's just sort of napping. Um, I don't know if you can see it. This is just right before the battle. Nathan Anderson on the right. He was killed a couple of days after uh, this photo was taken. Um, And so it's a strange thing, this war for me, uh, you know, when you go to a seminar like this uh, and everybody knows the issues really, really well, it's very abstract, you know, I think for most people. You know, for these guys, it's definitely not an abstraction. It's totally real. I mean, this is my last photo, and I'm going to be quiet now. This is actually a, um, 
This is a gymnasium uh, in Jacksonville, North Carolina, where they were having a memorial service for the Marines who had been killed in Fallujah, and they had their sort of gravestones out on the gym floor, you know, with the helmets and the boots and the, and the rifles. And, you know, it was just kind of a strange day. I, I went there thinking that I had been invited to go by the Marines, and I went there thinking that the place would be filled and there'd be a parade and a band and the TV stations. There wasn't anybody. Um, Basically, it was the Marines standing there. They hadn't even, you can't see, but they hadn't even, they didn't even have to pull the other bleachers out because, because nobody came. Um, and that's kind, of the, that's kind of the world we live in these days. Um, anyway, with that, that was about 10 years of rapid fire history. Um, I'll be quiet, and maybe we could have a discussion or we could take questions. Why don't you put the lights back up on, on the back here? Yeah. You have a microphone there, Tony? Okay. And you'll take oh, sure. Yeah. Right, right, right. Who'd like to open up? Uh, yes. Speakers could identify themselves. Uh. Uh, my name is Stephen Shore. In the first presidential debate, there was a good deal of verbiage about the glories of the surge. Did you see anything about the surge on the ground? And is, is this the, the glorious defining moment that it's made out to be? Um, I think it's working. Um, I mean, I think it's a combination of things, but, um, you know, I just got back from there, and uh, it's pretty extraordinary to see. Um, you know, the violence is down by about 80% in parts of Baghdad, most of Baghdad, and most of the country. Places like Anbar province, it's down 90%. Um, you know, I just, I wrote about this the other day, but it's, it's, uh, it's just extraordinary. I mean, I was in Ramadi, uh, in the capital of Anbar province, the, you know, the cradle of the Sunni insurgency in, in July of 2006. And, and it looked like Dresden, you know, it looked like Grozny. It was completely leveled. You know, there was one building left in the town, um, you know, and it was being attacked every day and the Marines were holding it at all costs. And I just, I spent a couple of weeks there, but I mean, it was, it was law, it was gone. I mean, it was just, you know, I was in Ramadi about two weeks ago, and, or three weeks ago, and, uh, you know, the Americans were walking around without helmets on. You know, they didn't even have guns. Um, uh, it was pretty amazing. Uh, the streets were paved. The rubble was cleared away. Um, it seemed very, very different. Now, I think it's basically two things. I mean, we can sort of talk about them if you want. It's, I think it is the surge, par partially. You know, it wasn't just that they put more troops in there. They used them in kind of a different way. I mean, you know, when I left in 2006... You know, they had, they had these bases like Camp Spiker north of Baghdad where there were, there were 17,000 troops, you know, and there was like a Baskin Robbins and a Burger King and like a Hertz rental car. I mean, it was kind of a joke, you know. Um, they'd go out on a patrol, then they'd come back to the base, you know, and like pop a video in the thing. And, and um, now the troops are in the neighborhoods, and they're in the neighborhoods around the clock, and that really, really makes a difference. Because, um, you know, it's all about kind of if you're, if you're an insurgent, it's about fear and intimidation, you know. Um, it's kind of that, and then the other thing is the awakening, the Sunni awakening. And so, you know, overnight, really, um, you know, the, the tribes decided to kind of reach out to the United States, the Sunni tribes. And I, and I think the short answer for that is uh, al-Qaeda basically overreached. Um, and you can talk to these guys. I mean, it's astonishing. I mean, I had a conversation with a, an Iraqi police colonel uh, who ha happily told me that he was blowing up American Humvees you know, 18 months ago. Um, and he said, you know, basically that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to kill Americans. Al-Qaeda came along. They wanted other things, you know. Uh, they wanted us to kill Shiites. They wanted us to kill government officials. Uh, we didn't want to do that. They started killing us. So uh, we kind of looked over here and we saw Al-Qaeda. And we looked over here and we saw the Shiite government with all its death squads. And we thought, well, hell, um, who are our friends? Um, and so kind of overnight, uh, they did this deal with the Americans, uh, and we now have 100,000 Sunni gunmen on the American payroll. You know, they're making 300 bucks a month, manning these kind of ragtag checkpoints, uh, and it's bizarre. I mean, it's, it's cost $30 million a month, which kind of pays for itself, you know, uh, with Humvees that don't get blown up and soldiers don't get killed. Is it fragile? It's totally fragile. Could it collapse tomorrow? Absolutely. Um, but it's a remarkable thing to see. If you just kind of leave the politics, politics aside for a second, um, you know, you can walk around Baghdad now in a way that you couldn't do, you know, um, two years ago. 
we've got Robin Wright. There's a microphone coming around to you, Robin, uh, from the side here. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Dexter. Your piece in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago on Iraq was wonderful. <clears throat> I have three easy questions. <laughs> uh, first, at this juncture, do you think that the, the Sunnis are, have, can clearly defend themselves? Is the Shiite government, Shiite-dominated government, <clears throat> going to integrate them in a way that will be acceptable to them yeah. and will make sure that this is sustainable? The second question is, what is happening with Mukta Dasada? What's your best guess of what his long-term intentions are? And the third and easiest question is <clears throat> on the future of Afghanistan. And, <laughs> and you, having been there at the onset, um, are we in for the same kind of challenge the Soviets faced with the same kind of prognosis, potentially even longer? Well, you said, God, you said those are easy. Um, <laughs> um, you can just take it around the David the first question was about the, oh, can they be integrated and all that? I don't know. I think that's the, I mean, I'll tell you, a, I'll tell you one quick story. I, it's best to just kind of illustrate these things. Um, I went to Adamiya, uh, which is a Sunni neighborhood in, in, uh, in northern Baghdad, completely under control of al-Qaeda in 2006. I mean, you couldn't even go there. Uh, I went there at night. Uh, I, I met some awakening guys. And really, the guy, the head of the local awakening council, his last name is Takriti. Uh, he looks like a Bathist recruiting poster, uh, kind of, you know, in the flesh. Um, and here he was, you know, making his 300 bucks a month. And, um, but he said to me, um, you know, they're trying to shut us down. They're coming after us, uh, Maliki, the Shia government. Um, I've come too far, you know. There's no turning back now. It's either this or it's death, you know. I mean, he was really, and it wasn't even about the money. I mean, it was about the kind of, you know, it was about his self-respect. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think, I mean, I heard, you know, um, you know, there's shouting matches between, you know, General Petraeus and Odierno with Maliki and his people, you know, pounding the table. Um, and the Americans are basically throwing themselves in front of the Shiites here, trying to stop them from dismantling this whole awakening thing. Um, I don't know, you know, I don't know the answer to that one. Um, um, you asked about Muqtada. It's all related. I, you know, let me tell you a quick question about Muqtada al Sadr. Um, you know, uh, I've been following that. Uh, he's a Weasley guy, and I've been <laughs> following him for a long time. And I kind of never, I'd kind of reached the conclusion that he was kind of never, would, could never go away. But um, I went to, when I was just there this last time, I went to the Solder Bureau. It's, uh, it's the, the, the headquarters of the Mahdi Army. Uh, you know, it's just like a little tool shed. It's very small. But it was always the place to go, you know, and that's where they were. And I went in there, and, uh, the, the, you know, the same old military commanders were there. They didn't have any guns. Uh, there were wanted posters for these guys all over town. Um, they were very, very chastened, you know. They were, um, they were not the same guys that I had gotten to know in 2004, 2005. The Iraqi army, which, you know, was always a joke, um, had literally put a, a checkpoint. They'd built a checkpoint uh, in the parking lot right next door to it, uh, and it was kind of literally towering over it. Um, but then... Uh, it's, it's, a little, it's a little bit more complicated than that, I think. Uh, I mean, I think they really took it on the chin. I mean, I, I had a conversation with, a, with a, a battalion commander, an American battalion commander, and he said, you know, we had never taken the gloves off before, and um, this last go-round back in, back in April and May, we took, we took them off, you know. Uh, we had good intel, and we started killing their leaders, and uh, the leaders took off, and when the leaders took off, the, the thing came apart, you know. But I just to kind of, uh, it seemed too good to be true to me, and I... I I went out one night at about sunset, and I just went, you know, I just drove to Sadr City, and I just listened, uh, you know, there's, I don't know, you know, 600 mosques or something in Sadr City, and, and basically, you know, the, the Sadrists have a particular prayer that you can hear coming from the, coming from the minarets. All the mosques were playing the, the Sadrist prayer, so, um, you know, it's kind of the there, but the not there. I think they, you know, I think they really got hit hard. Um, Afghanistan. Uh, <laughs> I was just in Pakistan. I wasn't in Afghanistan. I haven't been there in a long time. Uh, I was on the border area. I was in the tribal areas just a couple months ago. And uh, I think the situation is, is just unbelievably bad. I, I was just sort of, I mean, I spent a lot of time in Pakistan, but um, yeah, it doesn't look very good at all. I mean, I, I just don't see what the solution is. You know, um, I think you wanted to ask me a question about that, but yeah. Just David Edelstein and then this gentleman, so... 
David Ellstein from Georgetown and this year the Wilson Center. And I actually, you just gave me the segue into the question <laughs> I wanted to ask because I read your New York Times Magazine story about Afghanistan, was fascinated by the whole thing. And, oh, thank you. And got, it was an extraordinary story until I got to the end and sort of, you know, over brunch, threw it down and turned to my wife and said, well, what do we do about this, right? Um, and uh, you're, you, don't, like, you don't really give us an answer in that story. And I'm not trying to blame you for that. I'm just sort of trying to explore maybe, you know, it's become, I think, uh, well, it's become cliche to refer to everything as needing a surge, right, um, including Afghanistan. And it strikes yeah. me that we run the risk of making the same mistake there that we made in trying to take the Afghanistan model and apply it in Iraq. At, at first. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could sort of, I know you're reluctant to do this, but sort of comment on the sort of usability of a, of a sort of parallel strategy in Afghanistan. To, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm glad I don't have to make policy on that one. I mean, the, where I, I mean, I was in the Pakistan side, but if you just take the tribal areas, you know, and I went into the tribal areas, I met some Taliban commanders, I got out, you know, very happy to get out. Um, it's just, I, you can't surge in a place like that. I mean, it looks like the Grand Canyon. I mean, that's, which is the way all of Afghanistan looks like. I mean, how do you surge? You surge with two million troops? I mean, I, you know, I mean, the Soviet Union had the same problem. I and mean, I don't know, you know, maybe, I think with the military, uh, I mean, maybe there's some military people here, but they're kind of toying with this idea that they can do a kind of awakening in, uh, among the, the Pashtun tribes, in, at least in Pakistan. You know, they've just been wiped out by the Taliban. I mean, they've been, I mean, I sat with a tribal leader in, from South Waziristan, you know, where, where the Taliban is basically in total control. And he said, you know, he was a tribal leader and his father had been killed, but most of his family had been killed by the Taliban. And he said, you know, they've wiped out the tribes here, you know. Um, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know. It's not, not, I mean, it's a strange thing. I mean, you know, the, 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 the bad war has sort of gotten good and the good war has gone bad, you know. Yeah. <coughs> We have time for two more. David, if you just hand the microphone to this gentleman, and then the last question in the back there. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Will Amatruder from Catholic University. Uh, you describe uh, the improvement in Iraq as resulting from a deal that the Sunni insurgents cut with us and that we cut with them. Do you see any possibility that, some, that a similar sort of deal could be cut with a substantial segment of the Taliban, i.e., we'll leave you alone if you go after al uh, the, the al-Qaeda Arabs. What prompts me to answer the question is a, a recent bit of commentary by Ivan Eland uh, of the Independent Institute, the author of The Empire Has No Clothes. Uh, he, he seems to have very much of a Cato Institute view of foreign policy. His suggestion is the Taliban are able to recruit because all, the, all, all these infidel foreigners are coming in. His recommendation is we pull out our troops and NATO troops from Afghanistan, thereby taking away their, their recruiting impulse, but we leave Delta Force, special forces type units, to go after al-Qaeda targets. Yeah. And, and then we pay them off the way we pay, paid off the Sunni insurgents. Uh, is he smoking something, or could it work? <laughs> well, I don't even think it's going to be a question of whether it's going to work. I think it's kind of going to be what, whatever's left we can do. But, um, I, you know, I, when I was there, I, I met some, as I said, I, One more. I met some Taliban commanders, and uh, I met a bunch of the guys that were fighting, and they'd gone across. These were Pakistani guys, but they were Taliban. I mean, they don't, they don't recognize the border there. You know, it's just this kind of notional line that the British drew in the 19th century. And they'd gone over and fought. And Pakistani forces recognized against American helicopters. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, they all talked about the drones when they were there, you know, these kind of very jittery kids. You know, they were saying, hey, airplane, no pilot, you know. Um, but um, you, could, you could just talk to these guys, you know, these, like, 18-year-old, you know, kids who are going over to fight. And I'm, they're going to fight the Americans, you know. I mean, I don't know that it's a religious thing. I think it's more of a kind of nationalist, you know, ethnic you know, it's sort of Pashtunistan, you know, it's 45 million people on the border, in the border areas. Um, it's this kind of sense that there's these foreigners here who are occupying. So, you know, that may be the only choice that we have at the end of the day. I don't know. I, it's, you know, everything is different in Afghanistan because of the terrain. I mean, it's just, my God, it's like, you know, it is. It's like Arizona, you know. I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, I don't know how you do that, you know. Yes, sir. You've got the last one. <laughs> In the uh, Ron Levin and the Levin Group, 
in the last 2,500 years, there was only one successful conquest of Afghanistan, and that was Alexander the Great's men all married Afghan wives. <laughs> yeah, we heard about that during the debate. Um, that, we'll let that stand as a, com a comment. But uh, just as we adjourn, because this is a series that, that um, focuses on terrorism and issues, and not to kind of – this is really kind of off topic of your book, but you might have a sense about it. There was a bombing in Yemen last week or so at the U.S. Embassy, and uh, you know we are in October before an American presidential election. There's a lot of talk about al-Qaeda and an October surprise. I mean, was – was Yemen sort of the first salvo, uh, potentially? Or, you know, and there's this debate that Bruce Hoffman is party to, you know, of like sure. al-Qaeda central and how much top-down control it is, how much it's metastasized, and you have autonomous group. Do you have any sense about kind of where al-Qaeda, you know, al-Qaeda is a non-state actor, as they say in political science, in the midst of all of this, but any sense about their status and what they might be able to mount during this uh, yeah, I electoral mean period? Well, I mean, I, uh, Bruce and I talked about this, and I, as, as Bruce pointed out, um, you know, there's been a half dozen uh, either successful or failed terrorist plots uh, that have been traced back to the tribal areas, um, including the 7-7 attacks, you know, in, in 2005 that killed 52 people, the 2006 airplane plot. You know, these guys, it's like a franchise operation. I mean, the guys just go in, they get a little training, and they come back out, you know. Um, uh, you know, the Pakistanis with their with their passports. But I, I, you know, I put this in the magazine piece, but it's it's worth recounting. I had this fascinating conversation with the tribal leader I mentioned. You know, there's only two tribes in South Waziristan. There's the Waziris and the Masuds. And I met with basically the leader of uh, the, the Waziri tribe. And, uh, you know, he we had an incredible conversation. I mean, I asked him about the Arabs, and he said, they're here. You know, the Arabs are here. He said, all you got to do is go down to the bazaar. And you can hear him speak in Arabic. Um, and he said, you know, but the important Arabs are up in the mountains. Um, and I said, important Arabs? And he said, yes, you know, they have a lot of money. They have Arabian horses. Um, and when he said that, I thought of bin Laden, because in, I remember bin Laden had, had imported Arabian horses to Sudan when, when he was living there. Um, and, and he said, you know, I know these things. I'm the, tri I'm the leader of my tribe, you know. People tell me things. They come to me. And he said, you know, they bring food to their horses. And those horses eat better than the common people, you know. Um, they've seen the horses. They've seen the Arabs, um, important Arabs. You know, they have a lot of money. Um, I asked him if it was Osama. And he said, I don't know, but they're important, you know. They're definitely there. Thank you very much. We have uh, a reception uh, just outside this door. Books, copies of this book are available for sale and, and uh, uh, signing by the author. So please join me in thanking Dexter Filkins for really <laughs>